Hello. Hi. I'm uh, doing a call. So I just came here because our internet sucks. I know. Are you going to practice? That's awesome. Where we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. We think of portals like third space or how each of us, our uniqueness combines with where and how we feel ourselves in this historical moment. Homi Baba, who first articulated third space as a concept, tells us that third space is hybridity. It is an in-between place that brings together contradictory knowledge and practice. It is the space of interstitial perspective, the construction of visions of community by the liminal. It is the hybridity, I think, that brings us together to really make a moment to imagine another world. I'd like to now pass it to my collaborator, Ambreen Bhatti. I'm gonna pass it back to Jennifer um, and then take it from her. Uh, good, morning, or good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jennifer Rosales, and I'm the executive director uh, for the Center for Engaged Pedagogy at Barnard. And it has been thrilling um, to work with uh, Ariana Stokas Gonzalez, Umbrin Bhatti, and Amanda Monroe on this project. Um, you know, going off of what our Ariana just said, um, learning doesn't happen in a vacuum or in a bubble. It happens in the world and it happens with others. And we acknowledge and feel the grief and pain folks are feeling with the grand jury decision around Breonna Taylor's murder and the loss of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the context of so much loss and pain that has occurred this year. Um, Third, Third Space App was born out of this context and was designed to facilitate a learning experience for Barnard students that makes space for this loss, frustration, and anger, and enables students to address the work that can be done at this moment. At the Center for Engaged Pedagogy, where um, I work, we believe that learning is a transformative process. It is through meaningful learning experiences like Third Space At that we can foster mutual growth and facilitate the, collab the collaborative cultivation of knowledge. We are committed to supporting and striving towards engaged pedagogical practices that acknowledge diverse ways of knowing, forms of expertise, and academic pathways to learn as we strive for a more equitable future. To quote Adrienne Marie Brown, there is a conversation in the room that wants and needs to be heard. But before we get started on that conversation, I'm going to pass the floor to my brilliant and caring colleague, Umbrun Bhatti. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Umbrun Bhatti. I'm the director of the Athena Center, also a very proud alum um, and really excited to be talking to you about this project. So um, in the pieces I am, uh, which was screened at the Athena Film Festival in the before times, which is what I like to call it, February, uh, Toni Morrison reflects on Black struggles for liberation. She remembers asking herself at that time, what can I do where I am? And answering it with, I'm an editor and I'm opening people's eyes with words. It would be my job to publish the voices, the books, the ideas of African Americans, and that would last. Today, the struggles that Toni Morrison was talking about still continue, uh, along with the pandemic and the incredible loss of life, um, job security, human connection, and all else that we're facing right now. So at Athena, we are helping students tackle complex challenges creatively, collaboratively, and conscious of impact, meeting responsibly. We know that our students will lead us to a better world because we don't have to go back to normal. Um, for many of us, normal was not actually all that great. And so we're thinking about who is already leading us to that better world. What can we learn from them? What can each of us do where we are, what is possible, and what do we want? And how can we work together to create it? 
These are the questions that the three of us have been asking us, along with all of our friends and colleagues and families and everyone um, since this spring when everything changed. So I, we just talked about where we were coming from with our center, but I wanna say that this has been a truly collaborative effort. It's not just between our three centers, but so many of us at the college. So I'm gonna say a few thank yous. I hope I'm not gonna miss anyone. And if I miss anyone, it was totally an accident. Um, so thank you to President Bylock, to Provost Bell, to Joanne Pratz, Victoria Gordon, Hannah Rivers, Claire DeMilo, Aaron Bryson, Corey Lugo, Matt Hamilton, Quenta Battelle, and the entire Barnard Communications team. And now I'm gonna introduce you to Amanda Monroe, who you've already met in the chat. Amanda is our incredible project manager for the Third Space Initiative. Uh, she joins us also while simultaneously doing her first year, um, uh, first year in the MDiv program at Union Theological Seminary. She's drawing on her experience connecting community, uh, directing community-based learning at Georgetown Center for Social Justice for the past seven years. So thank you, Amanda. Thank you so much, Umbreen. And I'm going to also add Yuki Kato, um, a colleague of mine from Georgetown um, to our sort of central area. If you click on speaker view, you'll just see the few of us that are spotlighted right now. Um, and we're gonna say goodbye for a moment to Ariana and <laughs> Jennifer. Um, and thank you, Umbreen. We're gonna see you in a minute as well. Um, so hi everyone, it's so wonderful to have you here. I'm excited about our uh, afternoon together. So we're gonna start off, Yuki and I are gonna have a conversation about change making. And then from there, we'll engage some build students, some students who are already participating in third space, as well as one of our facilitators uh, to get involved and talk about what change looks like this year. So just so that you know, if you have questions throughout the rest of this session, you can feel free to chat Elizabeth Kim and also Hannah Rivers. Uh, they are hosting the meeting and can take the chat questions you have and send them to Yuki and myself to answer questions. They can also answer technological questions you have. Know that this session is being recorded. It will be posted later if you need to dip out at any point in time. We'll have it posted along with closed captioning when we post it um, to the Spark website. And anything else that you need to know, this is gonna be really great. Oh, if you don't wanna be a part of this, you can also check out, we're live streaming to the Athena page on Facebook Live as well. Um, so with that being said, I wanna make sure that you know how to continue to interact with Spark this year. You can bookmark our website, barnard.edu forward slash Spark. You can sign up for the Spark mailing list and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. I was very excited. It launched this morning, which is Spark underscore third space. There's actually no at in that. So Spark underscore third space. And you can, uh, by subscribing to that channel, you can catch new Sparks as they're published this year. Our hope is that the Sparks will sustain our collective work here for meaningful change during this time of being a community that is together apart. So if you're tuning in right now, you're joining over 100 current Barnard students who've committed to Third Space's year-long co-curricular program, BUILD. Through BUILD, students will contribute to important change in their local communities this year while supporting and learning from each other along the way. And we know that it's important to enter the space of change making humbly and wisely. Many ancestors have gone before us in this work and it's important to acknowledge that. It's important to acknowledge the land that we're on as we're doing the work. It's important to acknowledge everyone that has gone before us. We know that working in community engagement and social change within higher education specifically is complex. Some of the most transformative social movements in history, not only in the US, but all over the world, are and have been ignited by college students like yourselves. So there's great potential here, but there's also great potential for harm. There are many stories and significant research documenting the harm that university communities, college students, and their professors, people like me, have created, particularly while interacting with vulnerable communities. Painfully, often this harm is done with a belief and intention that we are doing good. So on that note, I'm uh, pleased to introduce you to Dr. Yuki Kato, who is our guest today. Dr. Kato is one of the contributors to this important research about the impacts of good intentions. Um, her research currently focuses on systems of food justice and her recent co-edited book, A Recipe for Gentrification, examines the role of social entrepreneurs working on environmental and food justice in a gentrifying city. 
She's also published research particularly relevant for those of us wishing to respond to the current pandemic and environmental crisis that helps us learn about post-Katrina New Orleans. That research investigated the rise of urban agricultural cultivation and the formation of new nonprofits led by recent college grads, lessons from which we'd like to learn today as we engage in these build projects this year. Dr. Cotto is a scholar activist. Her community-based research and teaching are involved with justice movements. So thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. Like I said, if you have questions throughout the process, please feel free to send them to Hannah and Liz in the chat. So to start out, um, I'm wondering if you would share with us a little bit about your work in Louisiana after Hurricane Katrina, what you learned from that experience and, and how you think that might inform our work today. Were you a professor in New Orleans when Katrina hit? Yes. So okay, I was, I was a college that. student. <laughs> well, that, that's well, not New Orleans, but I was a college student. But it's, it's, it's important to sort of think about how we experience um, major social changes like today and what, what, what it does to, to your long-term understanding of these disasters. Um, so I was one of the first uh, cohorts of faculty members to be hired by Tulane University a um, few years after Katrina uh, because many faculty members had left um, the city and the university. And so I arrived to New Orleans in 2008. Um, city was still in the process of pretty slow recovery. And uh, as an urban sociologist, I was pretty certain that post-disaster recovery was going to be part of my research. Tulane University at the time, one of the major ways that uh, it um, restructured uh, its curriculum was to add the service learning as a as a requirement for undergraduate right. students. And so they were now required to take two courses, um, once during the first two years, and then another one during the second, uh, third and the fourth year of their undergraduate degree, which was a great um, move to, to think about to uh, reestablish the relationship between the university and the community that was still struggling um, in so many different ways. At the same time, logistically, it created a lot of challenges for the faculty members and the department. And oftentimes, because we are sociologists, um, there was some expectation that, that we would be the one to do it. Um, and I hesitated to jump myself in for several reasons. Um, one was that, um, Oftentimes, I've seen some of the courses where, as you mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago, large number of students, you know, sometimes upward of 50 students, undergraduate students, were more or less brought on to a nonprofit that only had maybe six or seven staff, expected to provide something for them to do for a day. And there is wonderful photo you know, a reporting of that in the university newsletter about all of those great work that the students were doing. And, and I somehow had this very visceral reaction to this as being, I don't think I want to be in those photos. Um, and it's really, my, my reaction to that was not really a critique of the, the faculty member who really were trying to do their best or the students who really, you know, went in and seemed to have learned something from being in those spaces, but I really hesitate to, to, to jump myself into that space. So that was really coming from the teaching um, observation. The other side of this as a researcher. So I ended up doing the research on uh, the development of urban agricultural activity in the city. Oh, I'm so sorry. Apologize. Um, but what I saw there was that a lot of the researchers from outside of, of, of the city um, came into these communities, uh, surveyed, interviewed so, so many of the residents, they never saw them again. And I really felt that these residents felt left behind, although they poured their heart out, sometimes going through you know, tertiary trauma of having to talk about a very traumatizing experiences. Um, and perhaps they were compensated in some ways, but again, the research was done, some wonderful books and, art, and academic journal articles were written about the traumas. But I was still there watching these folks who continued to live in tra you know, trailers that, um, and unbuilt houses. And so I definitely really wanted to make sure that I'm not going to be 
replicating those problems, both as a, as a scholar, uh, researcher, and as an instructor. So that was definitely one of the two core things that I learned being in that place in time, um, I think as it you know, retain, uh, sort of relates to today's conversation. Thank you so much. Um, I'm thinking about just joining the third space team at Barnard this summer myself and putting together today and our website and how quickly things had to move and had to adapt to meet these always changing circumstances. So part of the work of social change and social justice is necessarily messy, right? It's like, it's a messy process. Mm -hmm. um, I've also heard you talk about the idea that um, we should be we should be forward thinking when we do activists, activism and create change. We should think about what will happen if our project doesn't work out the way we had imagined. So could you share at all from your experience about that, change making being messy, thinking about if it doesn't work, what will happen? Yeah, um, so this is another thing that I certainly have observed in, in, in New Orleans post-Katrina. Um, a lot of the people came in um, as a part of what's called uh, young urban recovery professionals. Um, and those are folks who came in maybe as a part of AmeriCorps or uh, started their own nonprofit organizations. And they work very hard. I do not undermine that. Uh, you know, I would like to underscore that I really have a great respect for people who came in and really put their sort of th their work into it. But at the same time, a lot of them are not there anymore. And some of that is not because they no longer cared. Life happens when you're in mid twenties, you might put in your work for five years, but sometimes life happens and you might go back to graduate school or you might you know, settle down and have families and your priority changes. And I think those are things that sometimes you have to not necessarily predict, but at least anticipate where you might be, right? And what you might be able to promise and commit to. Um, and if you're not really quite ready, then I think there are different ways that you can still continue to engage. And I think my recommendation always with my students and other folks who want to try to help is to look for who is already doing the work. 99% of the time, there is always somebody. And if you don't know, it's because you have not found them, not because not that they don't exist. And I think at the least, it's really the work that you should do in advance um, to see who's been doing the work and where they are and how you can come in. And, and oftentimes, I do not really say that um, outsiders should not come in. I think they can and very well should bring in their resources, skill set, you know, things that comes with your also energy, right? I mean, young person um, and flexibility. You know, I have two children. There's only, there are certain things that I won't be able to do as well. Um, but to see what you can offer to exist in work. And I think that's really something that is missed when you feel excited and just want to jump right in. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and I think the other thing is the long term and short term outcomes. Um, I think a lot of times we will want to see the outcome. And I think that's really what I was seeing in these um, service learning trips where it, it, it literally within eight hours, you want to see this, you know, space that was blighted and um, into, you know, clean, ready to go. Kind of a reality TV type of like an overnight, you know, check that we want to see before and after and feel like I've made a change. But change in reality, as many of you in this space probably, you know, know, happen very slowly and then oftentimes it's in, in a very nonlinear place, uh, uh, pace. And it, it, it takes a certain amount of patience and perseverance to, to be okay with the fact that some days, some weeks, some years sometimes may feel like, you know, it's going a lot slower than it initial sort of a pace that you think that things could be going. And, and I think sometimes those are moments also when you're working with somebody who has been doing the work, and I appreciate it, uh, Amanda, what you said uh, earlier about acknowledging people that who came before us. Um, those are oftentimes people who have also gone through that and walk you through the process and say, that happened right. to us too. You know, it's okay, right. just sit with it, and then it'll pass. And then don't give up. Um, and so those are those are things in which I try to give younger people with really strong energy to to go in so that you're not discouraged uh, immediately. Um, 
I so appreciate that. I appreciate um, this idea of keeping in mind, if you haven't found the people working on an issue you care about yet, it's not because they don't exist, it's because you haven't found them. I think um, often we can feel like, well, if someone was working on this, the issue wouldn't look like this, or wouldn't feel like this, or wouldn't be this bad. Um, but the more, it, for those of you who've gotten involved in social movements over, the, over this last year, or over the last few years, you learn that the deeper that you go, the more complex it gets. And that's one of the things I've really appreciated, Yuki, about, about your scholarship too, is that you've tried to demonstrate, or you've demonstrated in your scholarship, how a surface level, um, or, or our first approach to an issue is only the surface, that there's always more involved with it when it gets to justice. I have a quotation from you here, uh, from one of your articles, Unequally Vulnerable, a Food Justice Approach to Racial Disparities in COVID-19 Cases, so a recent article. And you and your co-authors wrote there that a food justice framework argues that food is more than just calories in grocery stores. So it's sort of alluding, I think, to the idea of food deserts. And if we plop down a grocery store, then all of the food justice issues or injustice issues will be eradicated. Residential segregation and gentrification, and gentrification, excuse me, racism in public health and medical institutions and labor conditions throughout the food sector contribute to racial and economic food-related health disparities. So considering um, that there are 100 students who are ready to contribute to change making in their local communities. They wanna do it with one another and we have facilitators also who are gonna serve a little bit as those guides who've who, um, experienced some of the challenges and learned how to be resilient. Uh, what, what would a justice framework entail for us this year? Um, or what might it entail us thinking about, uh, looking for resources for um, that sort of thing? So what we were trying to do with that particular opinion piece that we wrote a couple of months ago, um, just as we were really starting to see the uh, long-term impact of, of the COVID-19 uh, um, pandemic, and this is actually just before, I believe, the Black Lives Matter movement really took off, which sort of was unfortunately timely, I think, in that sense. Um, one of the things that we really appreciate about food is that it allows us to see interconnected nature of a lot of these issues. And so we are really not talking about food per se when we talk about food justice, but we're really using food as a lens through which to understand structural injustice in, uh, in realms uh, that goes beyond just um, supermarket and who has access. But we're asking, well, why is it that certain neighborhood actually doesn't just have lack grocery store, but many other things. Why is it so difficult to get around those neighborhood, you know, to transit issues? Um, why is it the people in that neighborhood um, are, for example, predominant? And, and, and in trying to understand these issues uh, by focusing on the food, I think it also allows us to understand that many of these issues are interconnected. And, I think it's the balance between understanding that the whole system is complex and and um, and has layers of these connectivity, um, yet at the same time to be able to focus on something very specific, right, as your project, because you can't really fix everything at the same time. But I think coming in with the awareness that just propping in, as you said, um, grocery store in this uh, in this food insecure area where we fix the problem, certainly you would not think that way if you understand that the food insecurity is deeply connected to structural racial injustice and uh, capitalistic ways in which you have developed food, uh, food systems in this country and actually globally speaking. And so to, to have that awareness of how your specific project is part of these larger issues, I think really allows you to not only approach the specific issue with a keen eye to how, um, what might be the best approach, but also perhaps think about building alliances with other folks whose you know, work on the surface may seem very distant from your own issue, but actually might be deep down or really fighting the same fight. That's such a good setup for um, what I was going to ask you next, which is 
would you be willing to walk us a little bit or move us a little bit along your journey of becoming, moving a little bit more toward the identity of scholar activist, sort of initiating as scholar and moving into scholar activist or teacher activist? What was that like for you? So I, I flinched just a little bit when you introduced me as a scholar activist um, because I'm still really coming into that identity. Um, I was trained in a more, I guess, traditional classical social scientific training of trying to be an you know, objective researcher, right? So we come, you, we leave our values, you know, at the door, we come in, objectively observe the people, and then that's what we do. We're scientists. And I think for a long time, I felt more comfortable in that space. Also, I think it really gave me a lot of out, you know, when people ask me, Mike, you know, I'm not really here to say what I think. And increasingly, I felt like that was just a cop out. I just felt like I should have something to say and why shouldn't I have something to say? And also, if I am coming in with certain ideas, then what I need to do is not to hide it, but to actually be open about it and to be able to talk about it and own up to it in my process. And I, I think that's much more honest. I have come a long way to be able to sort of say that out loud um, because we all study who we are. We all work on the issues that are somehow in some ways personally you know, important to us. And I think we have to know why that matters to us. And, and sometimes also it's a way for us to check our a little bit of a bias, you know, even if it's for a good cause, why do we think this is, you know, important? How do I understand this issue? And as a researcher, I think it's actually much more important for me to, to acknowledge that about myself. And so mm -hmm. uh, if I'm studying a uh, urban agriculture and I feel like, well, I'm not a grower, but I have to actually kind of come to realize that I grew up with my parents engaged in urban agriculture for a long time. I felt like well, those are two different things. And it's not, right? Because when I talk about urban agriculture, agriculture, I know I have a vivid understanding of what it's like to have chicken coop in a suburban home um, and, you know, backyard being the farm. Um, most people, I realize, don't grow up that way if they grew up in a suburb. And so I think those are different, you know, there are ways that I'm really sort of kind of reflecting on myself and who I am and what I bring into my research. And I think that I do the same thing with my teaching. Um, I'm very clear with my students about where I come from, what I stand for. Um, and it's not really so much that I'm preaching to them about, you know, what I believe in, but I think to be honest about where I come from, I think it really just allows me to, to, to see things in ways that I need to see as a social scientist. Um, being an activist, I think it's still, I think it's a bit of a balance to me um, because uh, I, I think it requires certain level of a commitment, um, but I do really want to be the type of scholar that, um, that actually work for the activism. If not, I am the activist on the ground. And I also really, this is another thing that I always tell my students, being an activist is so many things. We do see the image of activists, especially you know, for the last six months um, of people who are on the street protesting it. That is definitely a form of activism. But I think if we think that's the only way to be an activist, I think we're really narrowing our scope. But there's so many different ways that you can engage in political activism. Um, while you're also perhaps putting the pressure on the street. And so I would also like to think about my engagement with activism, for example, as a, in, you know, as a researcher, as a, as a teacher, as an everyday citizen. And um, I think that's something that I'm really learning as I'm actually teaching. And I really, in that sense, learn a lot from younger people who come to my class. Um, and um, I'm, I'm really humbled by the level of commitment that they have, level of uh, impatience that they have, um, yeah, and I really think we need that right now um, because some of us older folks uh, feel a little jaded. And so, um, you know, when some of my friends my age, middle age, uh, feel a little disheartened or perhaps a somewhat more up, uh, pessimistic about my future, and I keep thinking, why do I feel like things are going to be okay? And I think a lot has to do with the fact that I get to have these really With my students oftentimes who I know are still there um, and right. um, I, I really appreciate that. 
Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I'm struck by so many connections to the SPARK initiative this year. Certainly the six SPARKs that we posted this morning on our webpage are all versions of different kinds of activism. Some folks are talking about activism in terms of how do you create um, interdependent neighborhoods or redefine family in a way that works on a micro scale. Others identify as scholar activists who are putting forward the voices of folks who are closest to um, some of the harm that's being done um, in the most insidious ways. Um, some are prophetic voices um, who are sort of saying things in the public square uh, that are beyond provocative maybe in our, in our um, in the public square. And so I appreciate that idea that there are lots of different ways to be an activist. And also as students, I'm thinking about this being a first year student again myself, um, a lot of the work of being a student it seems is to uh, refine your voice. What is my voice and how does it contribute to this conversation? It's reassuring to me, consoling to me to hear you say, your voice is valuable even if you haven't gotten it totally figured out yet. And in fact, you'll probably be continuing to figure it out for the rest of your Definitely. life. <laughs> so um, there's a very, I'm in front of a window, there's a very sweet child that's um, making faces at me right now. So I apologize if I look distracted. I wanted to make sure that folks know, I'm gonna ask one more question to Dr. Kato and um, you can go ahead and drop your own questions in the chat um, if you have them and we'd be happy to, to raise them. Um, so the last question I guess that I have um, is one that we asked actually all of our Spark speakers. And it's rooted in this idea of that there is something unique that we can teach and learn at this particular moment. So much of what we're um, walking through right now or moving through right now is like what's impossible. But our question I think for this moment is what do you see as being uniquely possible this academic year? either in your own life, in the lives of students, um, and how could we take a first, how could we move in that direction? What's our first or our next step? That's a really great question. And I definitely have been thinking about that sort of just myself, um, being a sociologist, I think just, this has been a very sociologically rich year. I do think though, um, sort of similar to the reason why I feel like I stay positive, optimistic uh, about this time, I also think that my training as a sociologist, social scientist, and also, I guess, really kind of immersed in the scholarship of food and environmental justice for the last 10 years or so, really gave me a space to be able to think critically about it. Um, and what I'm really appreciating about this particular moment right now is that many other people are coming into that space, maybe, you know, by choice, but, you know, by accident in some cases, because for so many of us, this kind of a major disruption in life where we feel that either um, your resources or your personal connections is enough to get over the hurdle. I think for so many of us, there are always many ways to fix things. And I think this feeling of this is beyond my control, I think it's really humbling to some of us who are much more used to having that. And I think maybe that is really a really powerful experience for people who are otherwise really thinking of the social issues as others problem but to actually understand that mm. imagine what it's like to actually have that as your default mm -hmm. and to have a respect for that um to to understand what it what what it takes to get get past that and so i really think that there is a really great opportunity to to bring people more people into this kind of a conversation that used to be very on the margin you know in a radical perhaps thinking space and i think that is now moving towards the middle and i am all for it that's so great okay so we have one question from the chat um which is could you share with us more about how students in the classes that you teach, how students in the classes that you teach um, are involved in this idea of activism, it says. Um, can students be activists? 
Yes, I mean, I think most of the students, so I'm right now teaching a course called um, Environmental and Food Justice Movements, and it is a community-based learning course, and so students uh, are partnered with uh, several local organizations um, working to assist in whatever project that they have going in this very transitional period. Uh, but because I think this is an elective course, um, most of the students already are, have really been active in so many ways. Um, and they often bring in their own experiences into the conversation. And I think that's been really one of the most rewarding uh, aspect of, of teaching the course. Because like I said, I learn a lot from so many things that the students are doing on top of their you know, very rigorous academic demands. Um, if you are starting though, um, I think really looking for places to to join instead of start. Mm -hmm. I really is a great place to start. Um, and be okay if some of the first organization that you volunteer for maybe isn't really fitting. You know, there are many different kinds of organization working in different, you know, ways and you just kind of have to find the one that resonates with your values and, and the way that you want to work. But um, but I think just if you're curious and if you wanted to, to do something, there are so many smaller ways that you can get engaged um, and uh, just kind of start there. And I think it's one of those things where for the most part, once you're in, I think you're gonna continue to find things. Um, and uh, once you see it, I think you're gonna probably always going to have that activist perspective, whether you're really, you know, like I said, you know, out there protesting and doing very physical thing. I think that's also another thing that we tend to think of activism as doing, right. but I think also there is an activism frame of mind. Um, and so maybe you're having a conversation with your friend and you can actually sort of reframe the conversation in a particular way. And I think that's just a very micro level of activism, right? Um, that doesn't necessarily require signs. And I think engaging people in that kind of a everyday way is actually just as important, um, especially in this very divisive time. That means so much to, to receive, to hear. Thank you very much, Yuki Kato, for joining us, um, for the care Thank you again you shared for your words. Opportunity. Yeah, I'm so glad that you were here. I'm glad that this, um, this interview will actually be posted on our website as well, so folks can continue um, to return to it throughout the year and be thinking about the connections between what you're saying and our, our service throughout the year. So thank you so much. And I am going to transfer the spotlight now. Um, this is a, a really fun new Zoom tool that I learned. So thanks everyone for bearing with me. Bye, Yuki. Um, for the moment, I think Yuki's staying on the call to the end. And we are going to now bring a few students um, from the Build Circles this year, as well as a Build Facilitator. So I'm bringing you back. Thanks, everyone, for your patience. Dr. Rosales, here you are. And I think that Rudy is the last one got you. Okay, it's a good problem to have a lot of people. So again, if you click speaker view, you can see everyone together. And I'm going to transfer the mic uh, to Dr. Jennifer Rosales, and um, we'll continue with this rich conversation. Thank you, Yuki. Thank you, Amanda. This has been a delight. Um, I am going to introduce our facilitator and a few of our BUILD students. But before I do, uh, you may be, some of you may be asking, what exactly is BUILD? Um, so Third Space is a two-part program that includes Spark, which is debuting today, and BUILD. And BUILD is made up of 10 circles, which each includes about 10 to 12 Barnard students. And these circles are led by facilitators and meet for three hours once a month to give students the space and the support to consider their approach to tackling some of these challenges and producing social change in their individual communities. The facilitators will guide students in honing their skills to grow, heal, and build a better world in community with the people around them. 
And so instead of me continuing to describe the work of our awesome team of facilitators, I thought I could show you by introducing Naruti Shastri. Naruti is an educator, strategist, and engaged scholar working towards racial and economic justice that transcends organizational, cultural, and political borders. As a queer woman of color and an immigrant, the nuances of the movement, belonging, and social change have been both participatory experience and a research question for her, who has worked in numerous community engagement programs that engage students and faculty at universities on the East and West Coast of the United States. Welcome, Nairuti. Joining Nairuti are Michaela Davis Pedler and Deepa Shreya Sir, both sophomores at Barnard, both who are working on access to education through Build This Year. Michaela is working in upstate New York and Deepa Shreya in California. So I will let you take it away. Thank you, everyone. Hello, I'm Michaela. I am a sophomore at Barnard, um, majoring in neuroscience. Um, Nairuti, we're so excited to get to know you this academic year and given your experience working on social justice as well as working with local college students and local communities, we'd like to ask you the same questions that we're asking Spark and the Spark guest leaders. First, what is currently sparking you at this moment and what's motivating you to make change? Well, first of all, thank you all so much um, for having me. It's so great to see such amazing faces on this call. Um, and thanks, Michaela, for, for that question. Um, I think over the past uh, couple of months, it's felt difficult to be motivated. I'm not going to lie about that. Um, and I think uh, back when I worked at Hopkins, a lot of my research focused on um, the power of women's anger to inspire transformative and revolutionary change. And I found myself really sitting and steaming and sort of being in um, with that rage. And I found that to actually be a really powerful um, emotional motivator to not only um, come through this moment in, in a way that does center emotions and intuition and all of these sort of organic things that we may not think about, um, you know, but also is allowing me kind of coupled with my own sociological lens um, to, to look at systems in ways that is not just breaking them down and critiquing them, but also really thinking about what's next. Um, and the pandemic as a portal piece is really a brilliant one for us to be able to understand um, what's next. And something that's really been motivating me in my work uh, with uh, the kind of the movement towards a new economy, um, a lot of my research focuses on uh, looking at organizations and enterprises across the United States that have been um, really intervening at the point of microeconomics, right? The microethics and the small decisions that we make day to day um, and, and kind of the cumulative effect of these experiences and these decisions leading us into spaces that are inherently post-capitalist um, and, and a part of this new economy. And what has been so inspiring and humbling to see is that, um, you know, especially during this time, those decisions and those um, kind of moments become so critical. Um, you know, for example, we're working with a lot of uh, philanthropies and impact investment firms around the country, and their responses to, to COVID have been really uh, beautiful and have, you know, started to really revolutionize the industry of philanthropy and have really been, you know, thinking about trust. What does trust-based philanthropy look like? What does it look like um, to look at uh, folks that we're working with as clients and, and kind of really reinvigorating sort of the human values that make us all uh, human and want to center community in the, in the work that we do. And this, this moment, what has been inspiring is that I'm seeing a lot of organizations and entities move from this place of an imagination deficit and the scarcity mindset that has controlled um, our, our societies for so long into this really beautiful, emergent, uh, glorious space of imagination abundance. Um, and, you know, people always say necessity is the mother of invention and, you know, there's, there's really nothing uh, more than a, a global pandemic for us to be like, things are messed up and we need to do something 
different. So being able to see this happen at the hyper local levels. Um, and then again, you know, because of the national networks that, um, you know, Beloved Economies is building and, and other projects that are similar to ours are building, it's been really inspiring to see that, you know, folks are looking at this moment as a portal, as an opportunity to grow and move forward and build a world um, that is better and more equitable and more just. Um, and, and one that centers new values, um, values that we perhaps knew were true and real and authentic, um, but maybe just needed a little kick in the butt to, <laughs> to really make them make them happen and, and actualize them. So hope that answers your question. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you so much for sharing your journey and insightful experiences. I especially loved how you highlighted the importance of dealing with these economic issues right now and had such a hopeful perspective with everything going on. Our follow-up question for you is, what do you think college students like us who want to be involved in educational access in our local communities in New York and California should keep in mind as we start this year of change making? Absolutely. Um, much like Professor Kato mentioned earlier, working with college students is definitely awesome for a lot of reasons. Selfishly, it makes me a lot more hopeful for the state of the world and for the change that we can affect moving forward. So thank you all um, for just being awesome. Uh, in terms of, you know, advice and, and kind of how we're addressing issues of educational access or really any of the, the social issues that we've been speaking to today and, and I'm sure in other conversations that we'll have in the next couple of months. Um, I've, in the work I've done with college students, um, there's, there's two things. There's the, perp, the, the entry point for college students and really leaning into all the things folks have already mentioned, right? How do we approach community through a lens of cultural humility? How do we ask questions and not just provide uh, theoretical academic solutions? Um, and, and yeah, how do we enter space in a way that honors the, the legacies of ancestors and, and folks that have come before us and the work that has already been done? And also how do we legacy build and how do we plan um, for what happens after we leave? And I think one thing that is unique about this program and this moment in time is that there's a real reckoning with how we understand community. Right. For a long time, and especially in, in colleges and in college campuses, we understand community through the lens of both affinity and proximity, which I think is is pretty cool. But right now we may be in communities of affinity, but proximity is something that's obviously contested during during the time of social distancing. And so I think for college students to be able to enter into these spaces, whether that's in New York or California or anywhere else um, around the, the world, um, what when we're approaching communities, what is the capacity building plan and the legacy that we are hoping to leave? And in particular, how are we co-creating and co-constructing that with local residents and, and you know, generations of families and communities that have been in that particular area you know, for, for, for decades? Um, and so being able to have those conversations, whether it's with community partners, with your own peers as a part of these um, uh, circles that we'll be hosting throughout the months, um, or just internally reflecting, right? What is my role in this particular, you know, geographically de de defined ecosystem? And how do I make sure that when I vacate that role and you know come back to New York City uh, in the next couple of years, what, who, who's filling that? And how are we making sure that the change that we've affected doesn't just leave leave with us? I'm all about you know charismatic leadership is important, and also sometimes it can you know we end up trapping ourselves into the same kind of individualistic mindset, and that's not what social change and movement building is all about. It's really about kind of formulating an ecosystem of, of people and communities that are able to keep this movement going um, and, and kind of decentering our, ourselves in that process, which can sometimes be challenging. Um, and I think it's helpful to, to start with that conversation. So more practically speaking, you're talking to a community partner, you want to work on this project. What's the, you know, what's the one year plan? What's the two, five, seven year plan? And, and how are we making sure that we're encouraging other folks uh, to, to participate in that local residence and, and building capacity so that once we leave, um, that project isn't, isn't just a, a relic of the past, but really something that's going to be transformative and, and build capacity for an organization and local communities. 
And then our last question for you is, what are you looking forward to um, in the build circles as a facilitator working with current Barnard students who are all over the world, really? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I was just joking with a couple of friends earlier. I've been back to school in the fall for my entire life. And this was the first time after I left Hopkins and started this new role that I was not expecting to work with students. So when this happened, I was like, amazing. I'm still going back to school this fall. Um, one thing I'm looking forward to, again, is really just the opportunity to, to work with young folks who are all around the world and are looking at community through all of these different, both geographic and cultural lenses. I think it's going to provide for really amazing conversations. Something that's been kind of sort of a research interest, but you know, things that have come up for me is we've been studying really, again, hyper-local movements and transitions into um, post-capitalist economies, which is awesome and so cool. And I'm also like, how do we do this on a larger scale? And I think so much of that has to do with um, movement building and network building that transcends borders, um, whether that's, you know, state borders, national borders, whatever that looks like. And I think spaces like this that allow for, you know, students and community members to share kind of the, the best uh, and the most kind of worthy elements of their communities and the changes that they're affecting on these super local niche type levels and kind of connect it um, to other places. I think that's such a transformative tool um, to really understand, you know, how do, we, how, do, how do we make these values, how do we actualize these values into this next version of the world that we're creating together? Um, and I'm excited to be able to kind of lean into that. And I think at the end of the day, a lot of the values that we may hold true, you know, here in South Bend, Indiana, might not be so different than the ones folks are holding in South Africa, for example. And so I'm excited to kind of lean into what that looks like um, and learn from some of those tools and best practices and, and be able to kind of, yeah, redefine community in ways that are, again, more just and equitable um, and center values of interdependence and um, liberation and, and all of those great things. So I'm excited for that. Thank you so much, Narudi. That was excellent. And, and you, I can't wait for the Build Circles to start next week with you and your colleagues. Um, before I pass it on, I thought it might be kind of fun to ask Michaela and Deepa Shreya, uh, what motivated you both uh, to get involved in Build this year? And what are you most looking forward to? Um, I can start. So for me, I was previously working on a project in the community where I was looking to do a volunteer tutoring program for students in the um, capital region area of New York. And I wanted to join BUILD to kind of expand that project to other students, as well as being in an environment where I can collaborate with other students, as well as facilitators from around the world who can help grow the project. Thank you so much, Michaela. I think that perfectly connects to Narudi's comment about movement building and networking and how this is really what all of this is about. Deepa Shreya, what about you? Yeah, um, so for me, I don't really have an existing project yet, but I've been involved with the Athena Center last year. I'm on the student advisory board and I also was a participant for the Hunger Design Challenge. And I absolutely loved both experiences. I feel like I learned so much, not only about issues going on in our communities, but also about myself and how to be a better team member and facilitate more collaboration within groups. So from those experiences, I figured, you know, the Athena Center always does amazing stuff. I should join the Build Circle, become more involved. But also I had a few tragic family events happen to me during the pandemic. So I thought that Spark would be a great way for me to kind of parse through those experiences and figure out a way to connect more with my local community while also um, reflecting on what happened in my personal life. Um, Thank you. Thank you for sharing with us. and. Um... I think that that is spot on. That's what we're hoping the build spaces to be is a space uh, to really be able to connect what, what we're doing here to our lives outside of what might be happening um, on the Barnard campus, even if it's virtual. Um, I just I'm, I'm going to pass it back to, to you, Deepa Shreya, to, to continue on. But I just want to emphasize how excited we are and how there really is a spectrum of students involved in these projects that some of them, like Michaela, already have a formed idea of what it is they want to work on or project. 
and some of them like Deepa Shreya that are passionate and excited um, and but aren't quite sure exactly where it's going to go and and so we are we are eager uh, for it next week and not necessarily April when we find out kind of what the journeys look like um, because we we are looking forward to being present in this space. All right Deepa Shreya take it away. Thank you so much again, Nayuri. Um, we are really looking forward to the year ahead. Now I'd like to welcome fellow student Brianna Johnson to offer closing remarks for Spark Life. Thank you, Deepa Shreya. To close this event, I'd like to share with you the words of author Toni Morrison and then author activist Adrienne Marie Brown. You are moving in the direction of freedom and the function of freedom is to free somebody else. You are moving towards self-fulfillment and the consequences of that fulfillment should be to discover that there is something that is just as important as you are and that just as important thing may be your stepsister. And to expand, this is from Toni Morrison, to expand Toni Morrison's words, I would say your step-sibling. And um, this is a spell from A.J. Marie Brown. It's called the Radical Gratitude Spell. A spell to cast upon meeting a stranger, comrade, or friend working for social and or environmental justice and liberation. You are a miracle walking. I greet you with wonder. In a world which seeks to own your joy and your imagination, you have chosen to be free every day as a practice. I can never know the struggles you went through to get here, but I know you have swum upstream and at times it has been lonely. I want you to know I honor the choices you made in solitude and I honor the work you have done to belong. I honor your commitment to that which is larger than yourself and your journey to love the particular container of life that is you. You are enough. Your work is enough. You are needed. Your work is sacred. You are here and I am grateful. May these words inspire and sustain our commitments to collaboration and change work this year. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Brianna. Um, what an incredible and wonderful time that we've been able to spend together. Um, it really is uh, overwhelming for me to watch this incredibly beautiful thing unfold. Um, so I'm really excited. Um, and I think I have no more words than what Brianna said. So um, I wish you all a incredible day. Um, please make sure to visit um, the Sparks that are now available and up on the website. Um, and I'd like to um, turn it back over to Amanda to take us away. Thanks everybody. Really wonderful to have you here today. As you know, you can uh, follow us on social media. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, you can check out our Instagram and you can always email us at thirdspace at barnard.edu. Thank you for your time here today. Please continue to engage and let us know what you're doing, where you are um, together apart. Have a wonderful rest of your afternoon and a great weekend. Bye.